Coming up on DTNS, tech CEOs provide information on misinformation, memories of Samsung's future, and is Google's memory all alone in the moonlight? This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, March 25th, 2021, from Lovely Cleveland, I'm From Oakland, California, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. You know, before the show, we were talking about uh, all sorts of stuff, uh, when you can get vaccines, the depth of Lake Erie, everything and anything in between. So if you want that wider conversation, you can get on an expanded show, Good Day Internet, by becoming a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. All right, let's get started with a few tech things you should know. The information sources say that the U.S. Justice Department launched an antitrust investigation into Sony's announced $1.175 billion acquisition of the anime streaming service Crunchyroll. The investigation will look at if the deal will give Japanese animation studios fewer options to distribute shows in the United States. Qualcomm announced the Snapdragon 780G system on a chip, offering double the high-performance cores of the 765 SoC with 40% better CPU performance, 50% faster graphics than the six, uh, 768G SoC, an improved AI engine, and capable of reading three 25-megapixel cameras at once. It includes an integrated X53 5G modem, which does not support millimeter wave and is expected to be in devices starting in Q2. The Arizona State Senate was scheduled to vote on HB 2005 on March 24th, which would have required Android and iOS to allow alternative in-app payment systems, but it never came up for a vote. In fact, we're still unclear as of press time if the bill was pulled or not. An investigation by the UK's Competition and Markets Authority found that Facebook's planned acquisition of Giphy could reduce Giphy's incentive to expand its digital advertising, ultimately leading to a, lo a loss of market competition, as well as harming Facebook's rivals by offering worse terms or just cutting off service entirely. The companies have five days to offer legally binding proposals to address the competition concerns. And Chrome Unbox noticed that Chrome source code shows reference to a new... Game mode coming to Chromebooks. Although the mode and any features aren't yet functional, the code references Borealis, a Steam gaming container in development for Chrome OS. All right, let's dig into one of the big news stories of the day here, Justin. Anxious to get your take on this. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, Sundar Pichai, and Jack Dorsey all testified before the House Energy and Commerce Committee, ostensibly to discuss spreading disinformation, extremism, and misinformation on social media. Questions from representatives involve potential reforms to Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, how platforms screen underage users, the responsibility social media has for the January 6th Capitol riots, and, of course, a lot more. In opening statements, Mark Zuckerberg made the case that Facebook is building systems to deal with misinformation by contextualizing and limiting the spread of content. Sundar Pichai pointed out that Google Search was a vital use for information about the COVID-19 pandemic and that Section 230 makes it possible to serve that content across a variety of platforms that uh, Alphabet and Google own. And Jack Dorsey made the case for open protocols for social networks, specifically pointing to uh, Twitter's Blue Sky initiative. So, Justin, uh, obviously there was a lot there. Um, you know, did you hear anything that wasn't purely political theater? Any any kind of nuggets of truth? And, and I guess... You know, when we cover these hearings, I guess, what should we expect out of them, if anything? I don't know. Uh, this wasn't even the biggest political story of the day, which traditionally it has been in previous versions of it. Uh, uh, you know, that was dominated by Joe Biden giving his first press conference of his presidency. So this isn't even really going to make the the, the front page of, of, of the political world. Uh, it, to me, was a lot of playing the old hits, uh, uh, some informed. I think by and large, the questions were more informed than they've been in the past. Uh, uh, it seems like some senators are listening to their aides a little bit more, uh, but uh, uh, by and large, it was it was not, uh, not anything that I, I think that we haven't heard before. 
so specifically, there was a couple little little nuggets here. I, I just kind of wanted your take on real quick. So one thing that was was talked about, um, Zuckerberg was asked directly about Facebook's oversight board and said that he would abide by the decision if they rule to reinstate President Trump. I know we're kind of all, you know, uh, that's one of the big decisions that that board is going to have to make. Uh, yeah. But it was also interesting at the very start of the of the testimony, um, Zuckerberg was very quick to, you know, when asked if Facebook had any responsibility for those January 6th Capitol riots. Uh, and he, pr I mean, very squarely kind of put the blame on President Trump's incitement uh, rather than on Facebook. Obviously, I think that's in Mark Zuckerberg's interest. But should we read anything into, into I guess, that, uh, you know, uh, abiding by that decision, but also, you know, him framing the situation that way? No, not really. I mean, unless unless you're going to see any kind of counterbalance here. Before we get a uh, uh, email, let me also point out that it, there was not senators that were talking to the tech CEOs, but rather representatives because represent this was a House hearing. Uh, unless you're going to see legislature that is drafted up, and even then, it would make more uh, a sense in the House, and even, or sorry, in, in the Senate, and even then, it would make more sense if there was bipartisan support for it, which right now, there's not much bipartisan support for for anything. Uh, but no, this is about scoring political points, and this is about kind of uh, framing issues. This matters more for Zuckerberg's public relations than I think it does for anything legally. Uh, uh, but but I, I did find it interesting that, you know, you put Zuckerberg in front of a microphone and say, if this board says that Trump gets his Facebook back, are you going to give Trump his Facebook back? And he had to answer it uh, point blank. That was interesting. The other thing that kind of stood out to me is just in general that big tech, at least in the U.S., when it comes to these kind of issues, is starting to get better about just getting in front of these issues as opposed to butting heads with them head on. And I think we, you know, we we saw that yesterday with uh, we we talked about Zuckerberg's, um, you know, kind of comments on 230 and, uh, uh, you know, having to have moderation systems set up and having those dependent on the scale of a platform. And I think we saw some agreement from that from uh, Jack Dorsey and specifically in regards to Twitter. Um, I think that's also one of the reasons that we're not seeing this uh, be so headline forging is that in a lot of in a lot of ways, you know, this is this is definitely something that they I, I feel like that came across as these platforms want to self-regulate. I mean, obviously, they don't they would prefer no legislation to come through. But I think that no, 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 you're right. No, 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 no. Let me stop you. They do want regulation. They want regulation that they well, have input they, on. Yes, <laughs> they, they 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 want to say, look, we did something. And they more specifically, I think, if you're going to be cynical about it, would like regulation that prevents other uh, uh, smaller competition from playing in those waters. Facebook, Twitter, and, and Google would love nothing more than if to get in the game, you had to have a gigantic legal team that cost millions and millions of dollars per year based on a sliding scale of users because they've got the money to do it and it would be hard for somebody else to do it. So yes, they do want regulation. Yes, they want to be in the room when it happens. All right. Uh, next up here, uh, speaking of Facebook, they announced they took action to disrupt. Oh, I'm sorry, Jerry. I'm reading your line. I thought you were going to do a segue, but, but you can read it if you want, or I'll just take it's it. Very I'll, 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 it's I'll, very I'll take, good. It's very good. On Facebook announced that it took actions to disrupt the group that secretly uh, that security research call Evil Eye or Poison Carp, which targets members of the Uyghur ethnic minority in the U.S., Turkey, Syria, Australia, and Canada. Facebook first spotted the group in 2020, used fake accounts posing as sympathetic people like journalists to get targeted individuals to visit malicious websites or download, uh, download Android apps that would install Trojan horse malware, Action Spy, and Plugin Phantom specifically. Although the group appears to operate out of China, Facebook did not link the campaign to efforts by the Chinese government specifically. The campaign targeted about 500 people on Facebook, although Facebook said most of the hacking group's efforts appear to be other places on the platform. Yeah, and this seems like something that uh, Facebook was tracking, you know, for a little bit while now, and kind of as a series of actions, um, you know, taking, uh, you know, uh, Facebook has also kind of notably, uh, uh, obviously, been very uh, active recently in uh, kind of moderating and blocking content coming out of uh, Myanmar as of late. Um, I, I, you know, with, I, I, I guess for Facebook, is this 
Uh, obviously, so their benefit of the platform, they don't want to be seen as uh, an agent for any, uh, I think, you know, foreign power or anything like that. Is this just simple, I guess, um, we would do this if this was uh, any kind of hacking group, or should we, I guess, should we read Justin anything more into, you know, uh, kind of a hot button issue um, with, uh, you know, uh, the Uyghurs in China? It's both, because on one hand, this is a lot of the thankless work that platforms like Facebook and Twitter and 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 Twitch and, and, and all sorts of any of these, as much as we like to hate on what they, when they don't do things that we want them to do, all of these platforms, and sometimes at the cost of human moderation, might I add, uh, remove a lot of 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 uh, malicious content, of horrifying content, uh, of every day. So on one hand, this is you know just punching a clock. This is what we do. On the other side, if you've got something that's in the headlines. And Facebook knows this very well with what happened with Russia during the 2016 election. If anything that you normally do coincides with something that a lot of people care about for other reasons, then the the, the messaging on this can be outsized and often is. So yes, this is not anything new for them. Uh, no, this, well, yes, this is normal. Yes, this is also <laughs> something that they do need to pay very close attention to because of the tendrils going away from it. All right, well, something else you should be paying attention to is Samsung announced a 512 gigabyte DDR5 memory module. The first use Intel's high K metal gate production technology and uh, through silicon uh, uh, TSV chip stacking. The DDR5 memory is capable of 7,200 megabits per second speeds, which translate to roughly 57.6 gigabytes per second transfer speeds on a single memory channel. Double that of DDR4, and keep in mind that uh, most production systems we're estimating are going to have at least eight channels, so we're talking about some serious transfer here. The modules will initially be aimed at high-performance computing applications, things like supercomputers and data centers, and be supported by Intel's next-gen Sapphire Rapids Xeon scalable processors, potentially seeing supported consumer platforms in 2022. We don't have confirmation, but it seems like l likely that AMD's next uh, Zen platform is going to support it. That's what all the rumors are kind of saying. So. I mean, Justin, obviously you have a definite need for a 512 gigabyte memory <laughs> dim uh, in your next uh, laptop, right? Oh man, well, you know, I'm building a new studio for myself at, at the new place in Texas. So uh, absolutely, yeah, I'm gonna need a few of these. Like, let, let's see, did, 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 Samsung, you got an offer code or anything? Like, can I type <laughs> in DTNS at checkout and get 10% off? Maybe uh, we can do it. No, this is obviously for, for supercomputers and, and AI, right? Well, at that at that size and where this kind of fits into some broader industry terms is we recently saw um, another kind of high performant memory ish uh, uh, memory standard. Um, I'm thinking 3D CrossPoint or Intel's Optane. It might be hitting the skids a little bit with uh, a Micron kind of pulling out of production of that. And that's something where where these are really useful, especially for like supercomputers or data centers, is the more of you know, your giant uh, data data warehouse or something like that that you can put into memory, the better for, you know, whatever, uh, you know, SQL Server or, um, uh, you know, uh, your, any kind of application that you have that you can just put directly into memory, you're going to get huge performance benefits uh, out of this. And, uh, you know, more memory is better. Again, right now, we're kind of at the point where these are, um, these are academic until the platforms that come out support them, you know, because right now this is kind of like a science fair project, but, you know that kind of speed uh, also uh, kind of in the in the read here. It also uses I think almost twenty percent less power than when compared to DDR4. So you know data centers faster memory that takes up less power that you can put a huge amount on a tiny little dim. Um, you know obviously has some big applications. When those speeds come down to consumers, um, it doesn't seem like it's going to be too far off in the future either. So uh, some interesting stuff uh, that way as well. All right. Uh, what do you? Uh, so uh, before we move on to our next discussion, we want to know what you want to talk about on the show. One way to let us know: our subreddit, submit stories, and vote on them over at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Nine to five, Google spotted a new feature in the Google Assistant app APK called Memory. Described as an easy, quick way to save and find everything in one place, this serves as a central hub in the Discover section to save reminders, 
thoughts and on-screen content and will automatically extract URLs from screenshots and pull contextual information into actionable items like tracking shipments. Memories are organized into a feed of cards sorted in reverse chronological order with the ability to tag them by priority. Google is currently testing the integration with employees, although it's not clear if or when it would be rolled out to the public. So this kind of caught my eye, Justin, because right now, Google has some very in, some very good integrations with Assistant. Um, I, I use it. I have a Google Hub. I generally enjoy it for kind of single purpose things. But I also use you know services like Google Keep or, or a lot of their other productivity stuff. And all of that Google Assistant stuff, when it comes to that, is weirdly siloed. Like like you, if you set a reminder in a Google Keep, it doesn't sync with Google Assistant. So I, I feel like Google is trying to. I hope this is not just a little bit of uh, uh, paint on more assistant stuff that doesn't kind of speak to their other ecosystem because I feel like it's kind of a mess right now. Google's UI sucks with seven X's. It's really <laughs> bad. Like, and, and, and it, it's fascinating that they want to get into the world of productivity uh, uh, stuff. And they already have, like you mentioned with keep to a certain extent, because that is for me, famously a place where UI is a tricky thing. When you are trying to map effectively the human brain, something that is intuitive so we can keep an eye on what we have to do and, 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 and make actionable decisions based on it, that sometimes information is surfaced to you if you would forget it. That's a really tricky thing. If anything, that is kind of the, the, the ultimate double black diamond of user <laughs> interfaces because all of us have different ways of thinking about it, contextualizing our life. And you don't realize how much that is built on hacks and shortcuts based on your own experiences. So the idea of Google, which is great at offering raw materials, great at offering, hey, what if we threw a ton of storage at something and we engineered it in a way that made it work? Boom, docs, boom, spreadsheets, boom, uh, storage, boom, email, right? They're great at it. When it comes to making that easy to interact with, boy, howdy, are are, are, are they not great? And all you have to do is look at stuff like, uh, uh, Rich, have you ever played around with Notion? Oh, Notion. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That, to me, feels like what Docs should be. <laughs> like, that 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 if, 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 if you looked at Google Docs and said, all right, let's let's take it out of the 90s. Effectively, this is still in in the year of our Lord 2021, <laughs> a a Kmart version of the Microsoft Office suite that that you know came on your your compact PC that you ran Doom on. Uh, uh, now, it, it, it's basically the exact same thing. So I I have very little hope that a doing a productivity suite, b integrating it directly with voice assistant, which you would think is a slam dunk. Like they do a great voice assistant, but I, boy, do I got, uh, uh, I, I got, I got questions on exactly how well it will work. This almost seems like it's working almost from the, using a lot of the same tech like Google Photos uses, which is a, you know, a, a pretty well uh, liked service from what I, you know, I, I use it, I, I enjoy it. But like coming at it from the completely opposite direction, where it's like Google Photos does all of the cool OCR stuff. It 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 you know it kind of it looks at the image and know uses machine learning to know what the image is, so it gives you really great search. This is kind of doing the opposite of that, except that because the point of it isn't to store photos; it's to store basically everything. And like like everything that Google does, like Google Now or you know the Google Discovery tab, like when Google does the algorithmic magic and gives you the thing that you want before you want it. It's awesome, but when they count on that to be the only way that you interact with something, and then it, even if it doesn't work 10% of the time, it becomes infuriating. And, you know, obviously they're, they're testing it, and, uh, you know, if and when it rolls out, uh, we will see uh, how successful they are with that. We'll uh, see but... if we can add an 8X, an 8X. <laughs> Uh, here's hoping I, it, it gives me somewhat like Evernote vibes. Ah, I'm just, I, I hope but even then e Evernote, man. And I, I've, I I've, I have, uh, I've been there for things. I've been there for, what is it? 42 folders. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, uh, 
I'm, I'm there for all of them, and and they always confuse me. The they 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 befuddle the gerbs. <laughs> Well, one thing I hope doesn't befuddle you uh, is the British motorcycle maker Triumph, because they announced details about the TE1 electric bike project in development since 2019. The bike's electric motor can output 107 horsepower continuously uh, throughout its battery charge. So whether you're fully charged or down to 1%, it's going to give you that. And it's able to peak at 174, which is a ton for a motorcycle. Uh, while its estimated 120-mile range won't cure any EV anxiety by itself, it does offer fast charging, able to uh, fill its 15 kilowatt hour battery from zero to 80% in about 20 minutes. Woo. Triumph plans to test a prototype later this year, although it's waiting for the battery prices to actually come down before planning any mass production. So it looks like it may be a few years off, but you know, we got fast charging. This is like phone level fast charging yeah. that they're offering on this. I was looking it up because I didn't know off the top of my head on a supercharger, if a uh, Tesla supercharger, if you're like by yourself, no one else is using it, I think it can get to zero to 50 in about 20 minutes, but it, it varies wildly depending on, on a lot of different factors. Does, you know, 20 minutes seems like a real sweet spot to me. Like that's not, especially if you're, you're you're going on road trips, you could kill 20 minutes at a gas station real easy. Yeah. Or, or at, yeah. A, at, at a recharge station, you know. I think, you know, you're, you're, you're at that under a half hour is is a magic uh, a number. You know, 20 sounds enough like 19, which basically <laughs> sounds like nine, right? Like, so uh, uh, I think the idea of, of electric motorcycles is a fascinating one. Uh, I, years and years ago, this is probably over a decade ago at this point, went to go see an attempt at a world record for an electric motorcycle, uh, uh, the Killa cycle. I don't know if they still run. But uh, something that I found out even then, back with that that, that level of technology, is that power-wise, if you are looking to optimize for speed, electric motors were faster than the structural integrity of the like drivetrains and wheels and 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 chains that ran this bike, and that was the reason why they weren't able to actually even compete because when they started revving it up, it would just rip right off, and and that would be that. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think that, look, uh, uh, one of, I think we're going to look back in our modern era and say the greatest through line that we had was battery charging or batteries in general. Battery tech from the last 20 years on has revolutionized so much. And, and the concept of this getting down to, you know, a, a 20 minute zero to 80% charge if these numbers hold up is is amazing that is kind of game changing this is real quick um the great thing about this is uh it, it kills two birds with one stone motorcycles pound for pound are more polluting than cars because you cannot there's no room to put a catalytic converter on a motorcycle so they pollute just tremendously two Motorcycles already have a small tank, so you're gassing up a lot unless you have like a gold wing or like a, a Harley <laughs> electric light or something. And, you know, it's this this kind of does a really good thing because it allows you to create a product that's easier to ride because you don't have to shift gears on a motorcycle, which is, you know, if you ever tried it and if you're not, not familiar with it, very complicated. Uh, so it does allow you to reach a broader market, but it also allows you to kind of reduce your emissions and say, this is a greener way of getting from point A to point B. And uh, hopefully waiting for those better prices to come down might not be uh, uh, at least insanely expensive uh, whenever it does come out. Uh, one thing you can pick up, though, right now, you can determine if it's insanely expensive, is uh, Dyson announced three new cordless vacuums, uh, including its new V15 Detect Vacuum. $700 cordless with a laser emitter that illuminates dust particles on the floor, which Dyson's claims is situated at a precise angle to allow you to see dirt with the naked that the naked eye can't see. Dyson says the V15 Detect can also keep a log of the dirt it captures in real time using a piezoelectric sensor that keeps the log amount and the size of the dirt that it picks up. I mean, just in log files for your vacuum, has the dream come true? Oh, our quantifiable life gets ever more interesting, doesn't it, Rich? Uh, uh, now I can know exactly <laughs> how much hair versus uh, dead skin follicles versus uh, 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 dirt from my potted plant that I am <laughs> vacuuming. Uh, 
you want to know what this says to me? Because Dyson really made their uh, made their bones being this like engineering marvel. The the concept of a bagless vacuum that worked on a a a, a more powerful kind of level. Um, now we're really at the like we're at the 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 the, the fins and racing stripes uh, <laughs> phase of of vacuums, right? For even for something that that kind of made their bones being a big rethink. If we're into the, you know, the, the the laser lights and and the smart app that tells you how much cat hair you just picked up, uh, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I I think we've plumbed the depths of, of vacuum efficiency. I I just like what is what information is giving you other than just to make you anxious about the overall cleanliness of your house, which like oh no, it's for OCD people. It's well, yes, I, I think this, this is enabling. This is yes. enabling. Yes. Oh my. Like, and, and I'm sure they're gonna reboot the Odd Couple again, and and in this version, Felix Unger is going to be with his with his uh, laser uh, vacuum cleaner. That's a modern reference for all the uh, all the kids out there. <laughs> I, I mean, why not just go whole hog? Though? The one thing I was disappointed it was I was expecting I was looking for robot anywhere in this read. Sadly, I guess I have to use my laser vacuum by myself. We have yourself. Truly yeah. Well, no, the because the robot's not going to appreciate it. Right. <laughs> like like the robot's not going to if the robot texted you and was like, I'm having so much fun with my uh, with, with my lasers. All your crushed up Cheerios, please enjoy. Uh, yeah, just. um. I mean, you know, seven hundred dollars. You, you get your piezoelectric vacuum. There you go. Yeah. All right. Let's check out the mail bag. Uh, we have a mail, uh, an email, even from uh, Professor Metcalf regarding uh, a conversation we had on GDI with Patrick Norton. He's talking about uh, NASA's Drobos, that kind of stuff. He says, uh, "My Drobo died on me during lockdown, and I lost all my data and DVD backups. I am now sad. I originally that's." Editorial note for myself. I originally bought the Dobo, Drobo because I didn't have time to do anything myself. Well, now I have lots of times because pandemic. So he did the only logical things. Uh, I built a custom VMware hypervisor box with four 12 terabyte hard drives, direct link to a Linux VM. So you can make a 24 terabyte ZFS data store because after two decades of being a sysadmin, data rot terrifies me. ZFS, that's what it's good for. This is where I spent uh, six months backing upwards of a thousand DVDs and Blu-rays, which I also ripped uh, to the MKV format and made accessible through a Plex server. So my wife and I can watch any media we own from any device in the house. I also set it up as a file server. So all the Macs in the house automatically time machine back up to it. I don't want to say this is, uh, this is NAS bragging at this point, but also as a, as a current Drobo owner, I also, I, I like, I, I just appreciate the utter frustration that that platform can provide to you. So, uh, Professor Metcalf, uh, I mean, you you made the effort. Uh, well done. Cheers, cheers to you, <laughs> Professor Metcalf. There is there's sometimes on this show that we just bleed so dangerously into nerd tool time, uh, uh, where <laughs> where it is it is just bragging about our, our the, the 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 most epic nerd gearhead moments, and this is certainly in the Hall of Fame for that. So a hearty <laughs> to you, Professor Metcalf. <laughs> All right. Uh, if you have an extension for NAS that you built that you want to let us know about or anything else, uh, you can send it to us, uh, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. And, of course, we want to shout out our master and grandmaster uh, level patrons, including Chris Allen, Mike Akins, and Johnny Hernandez. And also, thank you to our new bosses. We always have to thank them. Uh, super appreciative of all of our new bosses, including Lisa Baxter, Hermit DeFrog, and Todd Troush. We are. Uh, uh, they, we really appreciate you uh, supporting us on Patreon, uh, and thank you to all of our bosses. Truly, from the bottom of our hearts, appreciated. Also, from the bottom of my heart, a thanks to Justin Robert Young uh, for being my companion on today's DTNS. Justin, where can people find more of your great stuff? There. So oh, fun. Rich, uh, always a pleasure to be with you, <laughs> uh, and and we hope uh, 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 Sarah is uh, is is back with us soon as she is recovering Absolutely. from her vaccine shot. But if you would like to hear more of me, you can head on over to politicspoliticspolitics.com. dot com. Uh, tomorrow's episode will feature actually somebody that many of you might know from the the tech space. Andrew Zarian uh, joins us for the first time 
as our New York City mayoral race correspondent. We talk about the state of the city, Andrew Yang's uh, uh, front-running campaign at this point to, to replace Bill de Blasio. Uh, and we update our um, greatest amendments bracket. We're in the finalist, legally required pause, for of our uh, greatest amendments bracket with uh, Brian Brushwood. So please uh, download that episode when it goes live midnight on Thursday, Friday morning, politics, politics, politics.com. Remember, you can support the show anytime. I'm uh, just head on over to dailytechnewsshow.com slash support and join the patrons. Uh, and if remember, if you need just the headlines, check out our related show, Daily Tech Headlines. Hey, I do that. All of the essential tech news in about five minutes, dailytechheadlines.com. Usually see that in your feed about 1130 Eastern. Uh, and remember, you can uh, 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 always send us uh, your feedback, show us your support. Just head on over to dailytechnewsshow.com. We are live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 20.30 to see. Find out more at dailytechshow.com slash live. I have to go back tomorrow for Pat. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Frog Pants Network. Get more shows like this at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>